In today's episode, we go over three of the most unusual and bizarre animal attacks that were sadly fatal. From pet lizards who were found eating their owner's body, a camel biting someone's head off, and even the tragic death of a young man in Canada caused by a close encounter with a bat. These three animal attacks are some of the strangest in the world. Hit that like button and subscribe right now. Welcome to Final Affliction. The exotic pet trade is on the rise. More and more people are buying wild and unique animals, with reptiles being no exception. In fact, reptiles account for more than 2.5 million imports each year in the U.S. The mortality rate for reptiles from capture, transport, and arrival in the U.S. can be as high as 70%, but this doesn't stop some people from buying them. 42-year-old Ronald Huff lived in an apartment in Newark, Delaware. He was an ex-soldier who lived alone. Although he wasn't technically alone, he had a growing collection of seven monitor lizards. These prehistoric reptiles were free-roaming, allowed into the kitchen, the dining room, and the bedroom. They ambled along, their heads swaying from side to side, their long, whip-like tails dragging behind them. Some of them had grown up to six feet long. They looked like Komodo dragons, fearsome and powerful. But to Ronald, they were his family. He had raised them from youngsters, held them and cradled them in his arms, nurtured them. He bred cockroaches in his apartment to feed the lizards, a way of keeping costs down for his growing collection. He also tossed them pieces of raw chicken, which they gulped down without chewing. They were feisty. Each grappled with the others to get a bite. He was a quiet man, keeping himself to himself. He worked at Martin Oldsmobile in Newark and readily became animated when talking about his pet lizards. He was even known as Lizard Boy due to his passion for the venomous reptiles. Some days he would go into work sporting fresh cuts and grazes as the lizards occasionally bit him. He showed them off to his colleagues. It was all part of the life he had chosen when he took in the reptiles over the years. He was lucky that they were only minor bites inflicted by the lizards, and he was lucky that their venom wasn't enough to kill a man. But one day, his luck ran out. No one knows for sure what happened on January 16, 2002, but Ronald's neighbors, Jeff Wildonger, detected a smell filling his bathroom. It was coming in through the hollow walls from Ron's apartment and into his. A smell of rotting flesh. A smell of decay. Ronald hadn't been seen for days. The following is merely a suggestion of what could have happened to Ronald. It is a dramatization, and although it has happened before, no one knows for sure if this is how it played out this time. It was feeding time. Ronald walked over to his refrigerator and opened the door. The monitor lizards knew the routine. The sound of the fridge door opening induced the anticipation of food. Saliva filled their mouths as they eyed Ronald hungrily. He bent down to take out the tub of raw chicken. As he did so, one of the monitor lizards snapped at him. It caught him on the arm and drew blood. Ronald recoiled and jumped up. His startled reaction only spurred the others on. They were crawling around his feet. Some began to pull themselves up onto their hind legs, trying to climb up Ronald to reach the raw meat. Their excitement was dangerous. Their eyes were fixated on the tub of fresh meat in Ronald's hand. He lifted it above his head as the biggest of the lizards lunged upwards. Quickly, Ronald, opening the tub, threw lumps of chicken at the reptiles. They caught the meat mid-air, throwing their heads back to help it slip down their throats and into their hungry bellies. But when the chicken was finished, the reptiles were still hungry. They had an insatiable appetite now that they were growing bigger and bigger. Another lizard lunged at Ronald again. He knew he needed to get out of the apartment quickly until they calmed down, but in his rush to get out the front door, he tripped and fell to the floor. The lizards were upon him in no time. Their razor-sharp teeth sliced into his flesh. They tore at his legs and arms and latched onto his face. The ex-soldier could have easily pushed one of them off, but with seven all tucking into him, 
He struggled to fight back. Their combined weight pinned him to the ground. He reached the front door and made one last attempt to open it, but it was too late. When officers arrived on scene, they knocked on Ronald's front door. There was no answer. They heard a scuttling noise coming from the other side of the door. There was movement in there. It was coming from someone or something. They knocked again, calling out to the young man before deciding to force entry. As they did so, they pushed the door open. Something was blocking the way. Finally, they managed to open the door just enough to peer around and into the apartment. A stench filled their nostrils. They gagged and covered their mouths. Then they stepped into the room. There, on the floor, was Ronald's body, slumped against the door. And right there, feasting on it, were all seven of his pet monitor lizards. They hissed at the officers, their forked tongues flicking outwards as they smelled the intruders. Their faces were speckled with blood. Their snouts were stained red. Ronald's face had been almost totally devoured. His molar teeth were visible as his skin and flesh had been torn from the side of his face. The officers managed to force their way into the apartment, ushering the lizards away. But the monitors were protective of their kill. They threatened to bite the policemen whilst they looked around the apartment for more clues. The lizards were captured by wildlife officials and rehomed in wildlife sanctuaries. The most aggressive lizard was put down. It was too much of a threat, and they were unsure if it had been responsible for its owner's death. An autopsy on Ronald proved inconclusive. Nobody could tell whether Ronald had died of natural causes and then the lizards had feasted on his dead body, or whether the lizards had turned on him and killed him. A police officer who had been there when the lizard boy was discovered suspected the latter. He was convinced the lizards had inflicted severe wounds on their owner before eating him alive. The way Ronald was slumped on the floor in front of the door suggested that he was trying to leave the apartment. Maybe they had turned on him. If all seven of them had launched an attack, then he may have been overpowered by them, especially as a few of the specimens were a hefty weight at six feet long. The evidence he had been attacked by them before, bearing the wounds for his colleagues to see, suggested that the lizards were aggressive towards him. Had the lizards he had nurtured for so long betrayed his trust? Had they finally turned on him? The answers are not clear, but this is a very real possibility, and attacks like this have been known to happen before. Keeping exotic animals may be interesting and exciting, but they come with their risks, and purchasing these creatures is only going to fuel the illegal pet trade. Another animal that may come as a surprising cause of human deaths is the humble camel. Typically calm and relaxed animals, they can become aggressive around the breeding season, delivering fatal bites and kicks to anyone in their way, as the following attests. 45-year-old Sohanram Nayak had traveled afar to collect a new camel for his home. They were useful animals to have around. They could carry heavy loads and travel where no vehicle could. Their toughness and robustness was an asset, and they could survive in the harshest of habitats. For centuries, they have been popular throughout Rajasthan, India. When Sohanram picked up the animal, he could tell that it was feisty, an aggressive camel, but a strong and sturdy one. Then one evening, just a couple of weeks later, Sohanram and his son Mohanram were calmly walking the camel out to its field when it suddenly became enraged. Spotting another camel not far off, it reared up, thrashing its head backwards and breaking free from its reins. The rope was ripped out of Sohanram's hands, a friction burn across his palms. He stepped backward as the huge hooves scuffed the dry, dusty ground. The camel ran off, running after the other one in apparent aggression. Sohanram ran after it, calling and shouting. He tried to grab its reins, he tried to reel in the unruly beast, but it was too big for him. It was too powerful. As he reached up once more to hold on to the dangling rope, the camel lowered its head. In a split second, it had lunged its head downwards and bitten Sohanram on the neck. With all its power, it lifted Sohanram up off the ground, 
holding him firmly in its jaws, a bite force of 400 PSI clamping down around his neck. So Hanram tried to fight back, but he was fading fast. The camel's teeth had severed his artery. Blood poured from his neck and dripped onto the ground. Less than a few minutes later, he hung limply from the animal's mouth. It dropped him. He fell to the ground, a cloud of dry dust surrounding him. He did not move. Witnesses say that the camel then began chewing on the man's head and even severed it from the body, its large jaws locking around his entire skull. Some of the villagers had witnessed the attack. They now saw their fellow neighbor lying in a crumpled heap on the ground. They ran at the camel. Together, a group of men managed to hold on its reins. They pulled and they tugged, dragging the animal over to a nearby tree. They tied it up holding it in position. The camel stood in the shade of the tree obediently. The men took out thick branches, heavy sticks, and clubs. Then they enacted revenge on the animal. Each man lifted his club-like branch above his head and brought it crashing down upon the animal. The camel had nowhere to go. It had no means of escape, no way of fighting back. It had acted out, and now it was going to pay for its actions. But the camel was likely to have been mistreated before. Animals aren't born aggressive or with malintent written in their DNA. They don't know right from wrong. They only know the instinctive behaviors that come naturally to them. If the camel had lashed out at its owner, then there would likely have been a good explanation for it. But it was too late. There was no way the men were going to let the camel live now. Its fate was sealed, and with it, an incredibly slow and painful death followed. When the camel finally succumbed to its brutal beatings, all was quiet in Panchu again. That being said, a camel biting his owner's head clean off is something very unusual and likely the last time anyone ever meets the same terrifying final affliction. Animal attacks come in all shapes and sizes. Not only are people killed by the largest, most fearsome predators, but they can succumb to the smallest of beasts, too. In British Columbia, there is a silent but deadly killer, one that is more common in Africa and Asia than in Canada, but one that will torture its victims before they finally succumb. It is a virus, invisible to the naked eye, the rabies virus. It has been eliminated from domestic dogs and all wild animals in British Columbia, except for bats. Bats are still carriers of the disease. In fact, it is estimated that 13% of the bat population in BC is thought to be infected with the deadly virus. Taekwondo instructor Nick Major was driving home from Tofino on Vancouver Island when he pulled his car over to the side of the road. It was broad daylight. As he paused in his car momentarily, a bat flew at him. Nick just spotted a fleeting glimpse of the tiny flying mammal as it struck his hand. He swatted it away, not giving the chance encounter a second thought. He drove home. Whilst Nick felt fine on the outside, on the inside of his body, a deadly virus was spreading. It multiplied in his blood, circulating around his body, on its way to infecting his spinal column and ultimately, his brain. Nick carried on as normal. He taught his martial arts classes at the Parksville's Cascadia Martial Arts Studio, performing as the lead instructor there. He was inspiring a new generation, a fun and friendly character to be around. He was liked and admired by his peers and the children he taught as well. But after a few weeks, Nick began to feel a tingling sensation in his hand, but the feeling wouldn't go away. The tingling sensation persisted and developed into a numbness. He began to feel lethargic. He assumed he was catching a cold or a mild case of the flu. His joints ached, and he had a pounding headache that forced him into bed. After a few days, Nick was seen by a doctor. His symptoms were reminiscent of flu, but they were suspicious that it could be something else, as he became progressively worse. As the rabies virus began to affect Nick's brain, he started to hallucinate and have strange thoughts. Some people can become aggressive as the virus affects their behavior and makes them lash out. Nick was referred to specialists at St. Paul's Hospital in Vancouver. 
After running tests on him, doctors found out that he was infected with rabies, but now it had entered his spinal column and his brain. There was very little they could do for him. Unless caught early and treated with a series of injections, rabies is almost always fatal. But the medical team didn't give up on Nick as he was transferred to intensive care. His body began convulsing, his muscles spasmed, and he had an intense fear of water. As muscle spasms in his throat took hold, he had a terrifying fear of choking, hydrophobia, a symptom typical of rabies victims. Whilst in intensive care, Nick developed a condition known as myelitis. It caused inflammation of his spinal cord and the lower part of his brain. He was placed on life support to help him breathe as his lungs were filling with fluid. Tragically, this didn't work. The virus had spread too quickly. It had grabbed hold of Nick from the inside out, and whilst doctors tried everything to save him, on the 13th of July, 2019, he died in his hospital bed. It had been just six weeks since he had a brush with the bat, a completely random incident that had cost him his life. Most bats are so small that being bitten by one goes unnoticed. You may not even feel the teeth break your skin, and the cut may be nearly invisible. But it only takes the saliva of one infected bat to come in contact with you, and the virus can be passed on. Nick was the first person to die of rabies in British Columbia since 2003. The loss of Nick was a huge shock for the local community. He was a big part of people's lives, and many parents only hoped their young sons could grow up to be like Nick, an inspiring young man with a heart of gold who tragically left this world too soon by the horrible disease known as rabies, one of the most terrifying ways to meet your final affliction.